It's good to be with you this morning to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we think of our fathers today with all their strengths and weaknesses, good traits and, and bad ones, let us direct our focused attention and worship to our perfect Father and Creator in heaven this morning. And as you take a moment to prepare yourself for worship, would you ask the Lord to prepare both your heart and your mind for worship this morning? Ask the Holy Spirit to quicken the words of the hymns and songs and illumine your understanding of the scripture texts and to make your worship pure and purposeful this morning. So let's take a moment just to silent our hearts and minds and focus ourselves. Heavenly Father, precious Christ, Holy Spirit, this morning we ask you to help focus our eyes, minds, and hearts on you. You are the only one that we seek to glorify, and you are deserving of all of our worship and praise. Faithful Father, we call on your name this morning as we ex seek to exalt you well. Be glorified, and we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're able, would you please stand as we allow these verses to call us to worship? Sing to God. Sing praise to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. His name is the Lord, and rejoice before him. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. From Isaiah. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. In 2 Corinthians, Paul proclaims, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. The letter to the Ephesians proclaims, Praise be to the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. And King David praised the Lord in the presence of the assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Let's sing together. Hymn number 38, if you'd like to use your hymnal.
seated. We were called to worship earlier with verses that spoke of many of our Heavenly Father's attributes, his eternity, his power, compassionate, full of glory and majesty, holy. Isaiah 6 tells us that there are six-winged seraphs around God's throne, continually calling to each other, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. An amazing, amazing picture if you think about it. And then in 1 Peter, we as children are told, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. We think of how daunting this is and who of us can measure up. None of us can. But we are also promised in 1 John that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So would you join me as we all silently do that now, and then I'll lead us in an old Puritan prayer from the Valley of Vision. Heavenly Father, save me entirely from sin. I know I am righteous through the righteousness of another, but I pant and pine for likeness to thyself. I am thy child and should bear thy image. Enable me to recognize my death unto sin. When it tempts me, may I be deaf unto its voice. Deliver me from the invasion as well as the dominion of sin. Grant me to walk as Christ walked, to live in the newness of his life, the life of love, the life of faith, the life of holiness. I abhor my body of death, its indolence, envy, meanness, pride. Forgive and kill these vices. Have mercy on my unbelief, on my corrupt and wandering heart. When thy blessings come, I begin to idolize them and set my affection on some beloved object, children, friends, wealth, honor. Cleanse this spiritual adultery and give me chastity. Close my heart to all but thee. Sin is my greatest curse. Let thy victory be apparent to my consciousness and displayed in my life. Help me to be always devoted, confident, obedient, resigned, childlike in my trust of thee. To love thee with soul, body, mind, strength, to love my fellow man as I love myself, to be saved from unregenerate temper, hard thoughts, slanderous words, meanness, unkind manners, to master my tongue and keep the door of my lips. Fill me with grace daily that my life be a fountain of sweet water. In Christ's name, amen. Would you please stand again if you are able? Brothers and sisters, if you are trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, our Holy Father welcomes us as sons and daughters. These truths are for you, ransomed child of God. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, 
so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might have the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. So to him who has loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing together. Fifty-three. If you'd like to use your hymnal.
This morning, Daniel Ia, who is a missionary to Good Shepherd's Fold, along with his wife, Corinne, and their son, Danny, is going to be offering our corporate prayer. Dan. Please join me in prayer. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. The Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Our Heavenly Father, how majestic is your name. You are worthy of our praise. In all of your splendor, strength, beauty, and holiness that you display, really, what is mankind that we ever come to your mind? And yet you care for us personally, and you care for us individually. Thank you for your steadfast love for each of us. Thank you also for, for providing the ongoing needs of this church through the giving of tithes and offerings. You have clearly provided for us throughout this ongoing pandemic. We have much to be grateful for. And on this Father's Day, please help the fathers in our body to, ref to reflect Christ well in their relationships with their wives and in their relationships with their children. We recognize that there are men who would love to be fathers but have not been able to. And also there are those who have lost their fathers. We pray for your comfort for them. We also recognize that some of us have not had very good earthly fathers. We pray that you would have mercy on them. And Lord, we have brothers and sisters who are dealing with health issues. Uh, we think of the shorts and what they are going through. Lord, we pray that we feel your close presence. Please give them peace in this time and we pray that you would trust you through all this. Lord, we pray also for unity in our church and unity in our state and our, in our country, unity that only you can bring. Please guide our national leaders and give them wisdom in their roles and in their decision-making. God, we also pray for the pastors and directors and staff of this church, for the elders and deacons and trustees and for the missionaries, uh, both local, stateside, and around the world. Lord, please encourage these people, your servants, not to grow weary in their work. Please give them hope and joy, and may they see the fruit of their ministry. Lord, we also pray that you would further your kingdom through evangelism in this very community, also in our nation and around the world. And God, as Pastor Steve uh, preaches from your word this morning, I pray that you would speak through him. Uh, please give him the help and blessing of the Holy Spirit uh, as he brings your word. We love you, Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. We look forward to celebrating the Lord's Supper a little bit later this morning. And we'll remember the great sacrifice that Christ made to reconcile us to our Holy Father. And we also look forward to the day that our faith in this truth becomes sight and we are able to join in the wedding feast in person. So we ask God to speed that day. So if you're able, would you stand with us one more time as we sing?
Our Savior, you gave your word to many people, and for a great number in the crowd, it fell on ears that could not hear, words spoken to hearts that couldn't receive, but on other people, it got through down to the depths of their hearts because your spirit worked. Lord, I can only speak words. I feel so human whenever I come behind this pulpit, but you can draw back your bow and make it sing into our souls, both into mine and the people I'm speaking to. So would you please be merciful to all of us today and in every corner, in every row, every aisle of this room. Lord Jesus, would you do something that humans cannot do, supernatural, because you are God and because you love us. Amen. Some ministers are drawn to speak on famous passages of the Bible. I generally am not, not because they don't help me and thrill me and are not huge in my life, but because of the sense of the inability to do justice to some of the magnificent places in God's Word that seem to be like the top of Mount Everest. Our passage today, though, is one such passage. It's a passage that many people memorize. It's a passage that people have on plaques on their walls you might see from time to time. For many people, if they have a life verse, this would be their life verse. You have heard it quoted many times, perhaps. It's from the book of Romans. It's from chapter 8. And it's at near the pinnacle of that chapter, which is itself the pinnacle of the book of Romans, which in some ways is the pinnacle of the whole New Testament. Romans 8, 28, having spoken for seven and a half chapters about the great salvation that Jesus Christ brings to us and about all that God has done for us, and yet the fact that Christians will have difficulties in this life even though heaven is coming, he says the following words. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version today. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, the general principle is clear. God sees to it that everything in life, both good and bad, work to the benefit of Christians. And so many people, as we said, cherish this as their favorite verse. Often one of the privileges I have of being a pastor is when someone dies, I'm invited into the family, and I get to see the Bible of the person who has passed away, if they've been Christians particularly for many years. And to flip through their Bible, you often see passages that they underline that were their favorites. I would say among the highest number of times I've done that, this verse tends to pop up by people who cherished it all across the spectrum of Christianity. This verse is like a lighthouse to a ship that's being tossed in a storm in the Atlantic. It, it's like a, something that people cling to when life has thrown them under the bus in all their sadness and loss. And yet other people find this verse off-putting because almost as many times as I've heard it quoted by people with reverence and fondness I've heard other people say, now don't come and quote to me that all things work together for good because of the magnitude of the sorrow and the depth of the sadness and pain that they're going through. This verse seems off-putting to many Christians because it does not seem to them as they view their lives to be able to deliver on its promises. That's what we want to look at today by taking the verse apart word for word if we could. I want to say right from the beginning, that the verse promises things great, but it only promises them to a certain category of people. Uh, it reads that we know that for those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose, all things work together for good. And of course, there are many people who have a kind of general affection for God, especially on a sunny day, rarely on a rainy day, um, especially when they're feeling well, not so much when they're feeling poorly. But this verse is saying that for people who truly know God and are called by him, this is what we'll come to at the very end of our time together. 
for people who are Christians, Christians in the biblical sense of the term, not just the cultural sense of the term, what does it promise? It promises first that all things work together for our good. Now, of course, this includes the good things in life because God is the fountain of all the good that we ever have. So, just like the book of James says that every good and perfect gift come down from above, so this verse is saying that every meal at a restaurant that you've ever relished, every Christmas you've spent with people you love, every sunrise that has captured your eyes at the beach, the strength that you have to raise your kids, to fulfill your career, to play sports, the open doors of opportunity that have been given to you, the, quote, lucky breaks that you've stumbled across, the times of romance you may have had, the books you couldn't put down, movies you couldn't walk away from, accidents you just avoided and saw, oh my goodness, how fortunate that I didn't have that. The education you were given, if you came from a good family of good people, all these things are from God. These things were given by God to you to make you grateful to Him. All things work together for good to those who love Him. But the verse says all things work together for good. And that, of course, includes what we would consider the bad, the F on your test, the flat tire in the rain, the rejection letter from college that you wanted to get into, the rejection letter from a friend, from a girl you asked to marry you, rejection from a spouse, rejection from a child that you poured your life into, the day the boss let you go, the awful telephone call that you received from the hospital or the doctor's office, the decline of your health, the decline of your country, the passing away of loved ones, the wars that your young men may know. The Bible says that if you are a Christian, all these things are for your good. Remember that when Paul was writing this, he wasn't just writing to Christians in general. This is in the book of Romans, Paul's epistle to the Christians in Rome. As Paul is writing this, Emperor Nero is just ascending the throne. Within 10 years, he's going to set Rome afire and blame it on the Christians. Within a very few years, he is going to put Christians um, dip them in pitch and tar, put them on stakes, and then burn them as torches to light his garden parties. These are the people that Paul writes to and says, all things are for your good. Well, what kind of dictionary is Paul using when he says that all things are for good, for crying out loud? Is he using a dictionary where bad is good, where sad is happy, where tragedy is good fortune? Do words mean nothing if Paul says that all these things are working for good? And yet he says that all things work for good. And next he says that all things work for good. Now, we tend to dilute God's intention when we hear the word good. I have probably mentioned to you a book I have never read but whose title stays with me all the time. I once came across a book, the front cover had a picture of a teenager in the high school hallway, frowning, and the title of the book was, If God Loves Me, Why Can't I Get My Locker Open? Okay, so perhaps as a teenager picks that up, or maybe even an adult, we say, oh, God's not giving me any good because I can't get my locker open. And so good for us is something fairly small, fairly immediate. The gratification is right now, and it lets us go on with our day. But God, of course, has things very much higher in mind. And that's seen in the second half of the verse where he says, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purposes. Now, our purpose in the good that we desire tends to be, well, Lord, help me lose weight. I want to look good. God, 
help me get the bid on that house, help my bid to go through, because it's a house I've always wanted, my dream house perhaps. Lord, I would like to be married, not just to anybody, but to Mr. Wright or Miss Wright, and I'd like to have a family. But God's purpose for us is a far deeper joy than even any of those things can provide, as good as those things are. As when Jesus said in John 10.10, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. And if you read his words, you see that the fullness can come to people who have a good home and have a good wife and to people who don't. Like it says in Romans 15, 13, this is the kind of purpose God has in mind. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. So peace and joy and a full life are God's purposes. How does that relate to not being able to get your locker open? Well, God's purposes, as you read the Bible, even if you just kept yourself to the book of Romans, clearly God's purposes stretch into eternity in heaven. God's purposes are not just about, Lord, I want to look good now, but God's purpose for you is the new body you will have in heaven that will look better than any Hollywood star does today. God's purpose is not just your dream house on this world. God's purpose is a mansion for you in heaven that will outstrip any architecture you have ever seen. God's purpose is the family you will be part of there that will give you such delight that the closest tie you ever had on earth will seem mild in comparison. God's purpose is the endless bliss, endless in duration, we might say, and, and boundless in depth that you will have in heaven as a Christian. That's what he's pushing you toward, things longer and higher and greater and longer lasting. And his goal for you, his purpose for you, in all this is that when you stand before Christ, you will feel the love emanating from his throne. You will feel your sins washed. You will feel yourself accepted despite your screw-ups in life, and that you will be able to stand before him with great joy and unashamed and have the bliss of his approval. These are the kinds of things that God has purposed, all of which will bring great honor to him, of course. And the great enemy of these good things, the great enemy is not sickness, not accidents, not disappointments in life, or chance, or bad luck, or other people ruining my life. The great enemy of all these things is our own sin. The sin that separates us from God, the sin that keeps God from showering us with more in this life, the sin that could keep us from getting heaven at all, the sin that keeps us, makes us merit his wrath, the sin that steals heaven from so many people, and the sin that lessens my joy in heaven because if I walk throughout life bare, barely thinking about him as a Christian. What our trials do, what the bad things that God brings into our life that work for good do for us uh, are these, if you were just to summarize it. First, the bad things often lead us to believe in the first place. There are um, many people who had the world by the tail, and then some horrific thing happened to them, and that is what pushed them to first believe. And there are other people who are believers, but their trials wean them from their sins. I remember, I haven't done this for many years, but decades ago, I used to ask people sometimes when I would see them, Christians, and say, of all the things that have happened to you in your life or that you've experienced or read or done, what has helped you the most spiritually? The answer I got most frequently was, when I blew out my knees playing sports. How interesting. For so many people, it was a major turn of focus. They missed being able to play as well. For some of them, they healed back and they were okay. Others, they were okay now to, to play sports at a lower level, but they could never compete, really. And for uh, other people, the pain was excruciating. But for a great many of these people, this is when this life started to become a little smaller and the great good things God had for us eternally start to be larger. So God uses these trials, these hard things, to push us into heaven in the first place and then also to wean us from our sins. As he says in 1 Peter 4, verse 1 and 2, he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he doesn't live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but for the will of God. 
which all makes heaven more heavenly. So it is all things work for our good, all things. And that good is higher than we tend to think about. Well, the next word that we focus on in this verse is all things work for our good. It is easy for Christians when they think about trials, if we have somewhat of a biblical notion or view about bad things that happen to us, it is easy for us to think like this, okay, bad things will come, but eventually they'll turn out okay. And what this verse promises is far deeper than that, and it's far more impressive and more encouraging. This verse doesn't promise just that things will turn out okay, that eventually, by and by, the bad things will fade away and heaven will come. No, no. This verse says that the bad we experience in this life, if we are believers, as we submit to him, the bad things actually achieve the good that God has in mind in this life. It is not just that we get good from God despite our trials. It's that we get the good from God through our trials. And the harder and the more long-lasting and the worse those trials are, the deeper that promise becomes. As I say, for some people, it's easy to trivialize this a little bit. You often hear something like this, and some of you may have said this, and it's not wrong to say the following, but you hear people say things like, you know, when God closes one door, he opens another. Well, it's true. Or when God takes something away, he has something better in mind. Doubtless, that's true. But the better thing he has in mind, or the other door that he opens that we have in mind, is often a door that we're still thinking down here quite low, down on this earth. Some good thing that we could picture that might happen two months from now that would be really cool if we got, and therefore I can take this trial if within two months, and please, not no longer please, God, if you would do something, it would be really special. No, but this passage says that your pain and suffering actually achieve for you. Here's how he says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. Our light and momentary troubles, he calls them light, even though they're crushing, because in comparison to what hell would be like, it, it's easy. It's, it's for a short time of this life. And when he calls them momentary, he means that this life will soon be over, as those of you who are getting on in years realize that it all went by faster than you thought. Our light and momentary troubles, here are the words, are achieving for us themselves an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I don't know, to use a trite example, think about physical exercise. Physical exercise is work. Physical exercise can be bothersome. Oh, not today again. Physical exercise can even be painful. And eating well, eating well is a sacrifice. It's a passing up on things that are so hard to say no to. And yet, the one who eats well and the one who exercises consistently, is the one who looks good at the beach. Now, this is the same principle on a spiritual level. He's saying that as you are exercised by the painful things in life that God brings, because all things are working for good, that that exercise of your soul through difficulties actually produces good things in you that will yield you eternal benefits in heaven. Here's how he puts it in Romans 5. We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, which produces character, which produces hope. You hear that? It's not just that in spite of suffering, God will give you good things in heaven. It is the suffering itself produces the character and the perseverance and the hope and what you gain in heaven. Suffering itself is part of what will make that phrase that you hear from Jesus if you follow him so sweet when he welcomes you into heaven's open doors and says, well done, you good and faithful servant. You who persevere despite real difficulty in this life. So the trials I say as themselves do that. They work all things for good. And they not only work for good, the passage says, all things work together for good. And what that means is that God is never just doing one thing at a time. Think of, think of a young woman who is driving in her car, it's raining, and she suddenly has a blowout on her tire. What misery. And so she doesn't know what to do. Maybe she left her cell phone at home. Maybe she's not a member of AAA. 
Remember, she doesn't know who to call or can't get through or her phone's dead. Now, let's suppose there's a young man who has been interested in her but has not known really how to approach her. And as he's driving, he recognizes her car and he sees her beside the side of the road and there she is in the rain with a flat tire. So he pulls up behind and says, can, can I help you? So he gets out. He's immediately soaked. He, he gets the wrench and he starts taking off the lugs. And as he does so, a truck goes by, splashes muddy water all over his back. And there he has to drag the, the he has to drag the damaged tire back to the trunk, put on the spare, and so forth. Now, as he's doing, he's getting soaked, he's getting dirty, she's late for her appointment, and so forth. But let's suppose now, this is his first introduction to her, and she deeply appreciates it, and it's their first bond, and eventually they date, and they are married, and they spend a lifetime together. Well, here you have God through a flat tire that made her miserable in the short run, that gave him some misery in the short run, and yet in both of their lives, he's doing something good. That's a trite example, but this is exactly what God is doing all the time. Whatever pain you are going through, it is not just you he's working in, and it is not just one element of your life that he's working in. He's working in so many things at once because he's infinitely wise. That's why it says we know that in all these things, that all these things work together for good. There is a complexity about it. Uh, God is thinking far beyond whatever we are thinking about all the good that he's going to do. Now, there was a problem, though, with what we've been saying so far about things working for good, things working together for good, all things working together for good. And the problem is that this promise seems to be true at times, but not true at other times. Because sometimes, as we know, the good that God brings from trials comes immediately. You are caught doing something wrong. You have a foul mouth, people usually don't hear it, and then you slip in front of Christian friends and, and you feel the weight of it, but that God uses that to help you dig out of something that you've had trouble digging out of, but you uh, never really got the push until you went through that bad time, something like that. Sometimes the good comes immediately. Often the good takes a lot longer but you do eventually see it in this life. I can't think of a better example than John Erickson Tata, whom we all have watched today, as you know, perhaps the first team from our church will go to Spruce Lake Camp, family camp, and volunteer to help families with disabilities and so forth. So much good has happened. But when that girl at age um, 18 dived into the Chesapeake Bay and broke her neck, she had no conception, of course, as she writes, she had no conception of the worldwide outreach to families with disabilities. She had no conception of the prisoners that would be doing something useful by repairing used wheelchairs that would be given to impoverished people all around the world. She had no idea of the relief that many families would experience at family camp, having a week when other people might take care of their child because of the ministry of family camps and this sort of thing. She had no idea of the worldwide good that would come. It took decades to see it, but she sees it in this life. Some good you see immediately, some good takes a long time. But what I'm primarily interested in here in this verse is some good that comes from trials is never seen in this life. And this is the hardest kind to embrace. Some of you <clears throat> have experienced things. I should correct that. Some of you are experiencing things that are so long-term and difficult, you don't know what in the world good will come from it. You might see a little glimmer of good, a little more patience than I have because of it. I pray a little bit more, but the magnitude of the suffering compared to what seems to be the small amount of good wrung from it is disproportionate. And you think, God, what's all about this verse? Don't quote me this verse, Romans 8, 28. I think about a cousin of mine. My uh, cousin uh, grew up in Tennessee, impoverished, you know, in a shack, worked in the fields all day, every day, backbreaking labor. And her mother, before my cousin was born, her mother married the local guy who was a terror of everybody. He was a drunk, 
And the only reason that her mother married this drunk is because he said, if you don't marry me, I will kill your parents. And so my aunt married him. And he turned out to be as bad as his reputation uh, was. And so he beat her black and blue um, consistently. And uh, what would happen is when he would come home drunk, my cousin's mom would gather the children and just run out back to a tiny little hill and just hide over the hill till dad came in and fell asleep. And once he fell asleep, he usually slept quite well. And then they could come safely back in the house. Once when, when he was drunk, he lined my aunt and my cousins all along the wall with a loaded gun. And he said, I'm going to kill you one at a time. I'm going to do it right now. And then I'm going to kill myself. And if a neighbor had not, quote, happened to come by right then, we all believe that it would have happened. Later, when my cousin grew up, was married herself, lived in a farm far outside of a city, or no neighbor is very close within yelling distance, one day her husband was gone, and she noticed somebody outside the door, and she noticed it was a neighborhood boy, a, a teenager, a young man, who was a troubled kind of boy, and he came in, and then he just grabbed a sharp knife, and he stabbed her again and again and again and again. And finally, when he left, and she just crawled across the floor to try to reach up and get a telephone, there were no cell phones back then, she heard behind her, and he came back in, and he said, I was waiting outside the door. I thought you might try that. And he went at her again. And so she was so cut up, I mean, to this day, decades and decades later, she still needs to take medication for the trauma that that brought her, and she still has physical problems from all that that brought her. What was the purpose of God? What is the good that God wrought? I will tell you she is a Christian woman. I will tell you she is a sweet woman. I will tell you that her faith is deep. But I'll also say that I know a lot of other sweet, deep Christian people who did not have to go through that to get the character they got. Why did God let that happen? What good is going to come? I don't know. She doesn't know. We don't know. Nobody knows. But God in heaven knows. So when the man was freed 14 months later, it just seemed like, where is God and where is Romans 8, 28? What good came of it? Well, that question, what good came of it, because we can't see any, is the reason for the first three words in this verse. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. Yes, we know from experience because many times we have seen God use some trial in a particular way to bring a particular good. But when things don't work out, as in this case, how do we know? We know because of another verse in this very chapter, just four verses down, Romans 8, 32, where we read, God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. No illustration I could think of could possibly match the poignancy of that verse, but just to give the dimmest idea. Here was a mom, here was a dad, they pray for a long time to have a child. They have not had a child. And finally, God gives them a son. And he becomes the best kid who ever was. He has a winning smile. He's a strong boy. He's a hardworking boy. He's smart, but he never shows off. He's athletic, but he always draws in the lesser players and passes to them and points to them. He is the kind of kid that respects his teachers, and yet he's brave enough to put bullies in place. He, he, he breaks his neck to be home on Mother's Day and show his mom respect as he grows older. He could have had many careers, but he craves a career in the military. And he is deployed. He is deployed to a country that perhaps most of us have never even seen at times our boys get deployed to countries we may never even have heard of. He's deployed there to help folks who do not know us and we do not know them. And while there, 
He volunteers for an especially dangerous mission. He wants to be of help. And on that mission, his legs are blown off. Or worse yet, he is captured and tortured and killed. Now add to that mix, if the father or mother knew ahead of time what the result would be of his going into the military, think about that. Think about it. That they knew that the people his son would help, perhaps some of those people would hate Americans. And they might see his son on the military base and despise him before he ever had a chance to do them good. And yet, if the son willingly gave of himself and knew it was coming, and if the dad and mom willingly parted with him knowing what was coming, this is just the dimmest picture of what was going on with God the Father and God the Son when he came to us. Think of the mess our race has made of this earth. Think of the hatred and vitriol, fist shaking that goes on all over the planet in every single continent and country all over the world through every generation that humans have ever existed. Think of this. Think not just of the race mess that our race has made of this planet. Think of the mess you have made, the messes I have made. Think of the things that you are the most ashamed of that you've ever thought or done or said that if you could take back, you would, that you would be horrified for most people to know. And now think of God's priceless Son, whom God the Father adores more than anyone in the universe, infinitely more, more than anyone. He adores more than anything else. That the angels absolutely love the Son of God, and that this Son now became a mere human, a divine human being lived among us as no one else has ever lived, spoke to us as no one else has ever spoken. He didn't live as a rich man. He didn't have the world by the tail. He didn't have a satisfying career. He didn't have a trophy wife or a family. Instead, he lived a life of poverty and hunger and loneliness as a single man facing the constant hostility of the crowds. He was described in the Bible as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And then ponder the apparent tragedy at the end of his life when he is arrested. He is falsely accused of things he never said or did. He has a mob screaming for his execution. He is flogged beyond description. He is stripped naked and publicly crucified. All of this he does for us, and he did it knowing what he was getting into, and his father sent him knowing what he would get into. All of this so that as he was dying on the cross, the weight of judgment for my sins and yours fell upon him. As it says in 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. So this is what verse 32 is saying. God, who did not spare his son, but gave him up to all this for us all, will God not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? The idea is that if God has parted with the absolute most precious being to him in the universe, anything else to give us that's good is no sacrifice at all. Anything else. Everything else that God would give us is just small potatoes. And that's why we can take the worst of our trials that are never resolved in this life totally by faith. Because anyone who would do that for us and says, trust me with the rest, he is a trustworthy being. Now we said at the beginning that all this wonderful promise only comes to, as Paul said, for those who love God. For those who love God. And he calls this in a different way, for those who are called by God. Now you may be like Martin Luther, who was in a monastery for a long time, who worked harder than any of his uh, fellow monks, but who said that he just could not ease his conscience, and he realized that he didn't love God, he hated God because of the requirements of the law that he himself felt unable to meet. 
But then we read that Martin Luther was called by God. This is not just some general call when the minister stands up in front and says, if you want to believe in Jesus, please come down to the front or bow your heads quietly in your seat. No, this is a call far deeper than that. This is a call where God himself, through his Holy Spirit, actually reaches into your heart and says, now, you, come. And you come. This is what he's talking about. It's to people who have experienced that, whether it was highly emotional or whether it was not, that these promises are for. It is like the song sung by Karen Carpenter. It's called A Place to Hide Away. It's a beautiful love song. and She has one of the loveliest, I think, the loveliest female voice I've ever heard in my life. And one of the short lines in that song, as she's talking about the, the man she loves, she says, I hear you whisper, and I must obey. You hear that? He whispers, and she is like, she is like metal, and he is a magnet, and she's drawn to him. It is irresistible. She's delighted to come. She can't not come. This passage is meant to do that to you. This mass passage is meant to call you by showing you the magnitude of God's love and the, the depth and extent of his promises to bring every tear in your life for enormous good. So may I ask you, as you hear this, how do you respond? Do you find yourself listening to this thing and saying, God, I do love you. Then these promises are for you. Do you find yourself thinking, I have not loved you up to this point, but I am highly inclined to you. Do not resist. Do not put your hands out. As he whispers, obey, come to him, repent of your sins as best you can, throw yourself at his mercy, plead that his blood cover your transgressions, and this will happen. And if you do, he will not only wash you, he will adopt you. And if you do, this verse will be true of you. When the apostle John saw what it would be like at the end of time, he said, Revelation 21, and I heard a loud voice from the throne in heaven at the end of time saying, now, that is at the end, the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them and they will be his people and he will be their God and he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or sorrow or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Please bow your head. Pray about these things for yourself and for perhaps somebody else. to proceed into our Lord's Supper. This meal we eat together is given to us directly by Jesus. On the night of his arrest and betrayal, Jesus gathered his 12 closest disciples together and ate a meal with them. And at the end of that meal, Jesus gave them what we call our Lord's Supper. The bread and the wine which we are going to partake remind us of Jesus' broken body, his willing, voluntary death upon a cross for our sins. The Bible is clear. The wage of sin is death. Jesus, for those who know him, for those who have come to him, he has paid our sin debt. These elements, the bread and the wine, they remind us back of that night of that arrest, of the following day, the trial, and Jesus' crucifixion. These elements point us back to what Jesus did for us, 
but they also point us forward to what Jesus will do for us. Because our Lord says that on this night when he partook of this meal, that he would not eat it again until he ate it with us in the kingdom. The Apostle Paul said, as often as we do this, eat this meal together, we show the Lord's death until he returns. So this meal is vitally important to us as Christians. And with that in mind, I would like to just briefly remind us for whom this meal is. This meal is for you if you are a Christian, if you are trusting Jesus Christ, if you have repented of your sins, if your only hope for heaven is not your good works or not your religion, but Jesus Christ who died upon the cross and rose from the dead. This meal is for you if you are a baptized Christian. You have followed the Lord in either believer's baptism or if you were baptized as an infant, you have been uh, publicly received into a church by giving a testimony of your profession of faith. You have made that baptism uh, as an infant yours when you were old enough to do so. And thirdly, we do ask for those who partake to be in a good standing with their local church. And if for any reason you were unable to participate in this meal, we are glad you are here. We are honored that God has brought you our way today. We would ask, as the elements are passed, if you would just kindly pass and not partake, and we would love to sit down with you and talk to you and explain to you why this meal is so vitally important to us. Our senior pastor, the last time we took, partook of this meal, actually began the practice of breaking a loaf of bread. And if we were a smaller church in a smaller venue, it would be neat for us to partake of the same loaf. But since we can't, I'm going to partake by breaking this loaf, and then our ushers will serve us and we will eat together. So 
isn't it good to know your sins are forgiven? Eat in thankful remembrance. After the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. In like manner, I will pour the wine, our ushers will serve us, and we will drink together. A hymn about communion. Isn't it good to know that Jesus will return for us? Drink in thankful anticipation. If you are able, would you please rise for our closing benediction? From the book of 2 Peter, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus, seeing that his divine power has given to us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Go with God.